Fair okay. deal. All right. So then I'll chair the meeting. Welcome everybody. Uh, so we're going to open at 5.07 p.m. a public hearing on an application by Tightline Properties to establish a landscaping company office at 83 State Road. Um, recommendations like should I, I can share the, the plot plan that they've sent us if that would be helpful for a conversation. Um, why don't I just do that? Okay, hopefully everybody can see this plot plan. I think Grant, since presumably we're all familiar with it, you might just ask if people have questions and then turn it over to Keith, who we know has an issue. I don't know, does Keith have an issue about tight line? I oh know... no, I'm sorry, Keith has an issue about, never mind. Yep, yeah. Um, well, yeah, sure. Any questions from any members of the public? I don't necessarily think there's much in the way of public here. It seems a little early to close the public hearing, however. It does. We can just... Um, Maybe we can keep talking. Well, I think we should... I think... I mean, I had some... I don't know if I, if I have questions or observations. Any comments from members of the board about this application? Well, I wonder if we have heard from the Board of Health because... Uh, the septic looks more complicated than often. Once we often really? see, and I don't. Um, I have I have sent requests for feedback to all the applicable boards and committees, and the only one that um, got back to me was the Waitley Historical Society, and I did circulate that letter, but I'll I guess I'll share it on my screen. Um, and I do have the septic plan, but maybe since, so I haven't lost track, Judy, of your comment about the health, the Board of Health, but maybe since we did get this one bit of feedback, we can just note that um, for the public record that the Historical Society would like us to condition any approval of the plan um, using language that I've highlighted here about discovery of archaeological artifacts and remains. And I I've seen- They would be happier if you called them the Historical Commission. Okay, the Historical Commission, the Waitley Historical, yes, not the Society Historical Commission, thank you. Um, it's not uncommon confusion, okay. but- uh, Right. But I did not, what were your thoughts about the septic system, Judy? Well, I, I don't feel qualified to, to know, and which is why I think the Board of Health, and this is where having the experts involved is, is important. So we do typically condition approval of site plans on that the applicant obtain approvals from all appropriate boards and committees, which would end. Excuse me. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess my question is, is that a sufficient conditioning if they fail to obtain health, a board of health approval for their septic system, then they would not meet the conditions of a site plan approval? I think I would feel more comfortable if they if we made an, ex, an explicit condition so that the building inspector so we knew to check for it and the building inspector knew as okay. well. And so the condition would be along the lines of that they obtain approval uh, from the Board of Health for the um, proposed septic system. Yes. Okay. I was curious in looking at this plan about the, and I was, it would have been nice if the applicants were here, uh, about that sort of 
to my eyes at least, my naive eyes looking at plans like this, this um, peculiar little bit of encircling, like, you know, this sort of extension of this narrow, it's not clear, it's clearly not a roadway, but, um, and I don't know if anyone on the board, my, one thought I had was that because the parcel where the building is to be built, uh, you know, they, supposedly the whole parcel is 60,276 square feet, the minimum lot size for the table of use, or the, I'm sorry, the dimensional requirements is 60,000 square feet. And I just was idly curious whether the lot has this odd extension, mostly to ensure that it meets the 60,000 minimum lot size, or if there's an actual reason or logic behind having that kind of border surrounding lots one and two marked on the Plan. Might anyone have a perspective on that? Well, that pre that lot creation precedes the applicant's purchase of the lot. It does. And uh, my guess is that's entirely why it's there. But I don't think they're they can. Oh, I'm not. I, I was really more curious about if when they acquired this lot or this lot was laid out this way. Oh, yeah. Knowing about the 60,000 square foot minimum. I'm sure. And it's that kind that's... of this, I can't see that there'd be any utility for that extra piece of extension of the lot, except to make it work in our dimensional requirements. I'm sure that's the case. And it was probably done when the home company divided the lots up. Hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking about it. It seems like one of those cases where um, an unintended consequence of a uh, of uh, one of these dimensional requirements, like, but nothing that we would do. Nothing that I had any feeling that we would need or want to do anything about it. Just was the first time I've seen something like this come up. My own looking at the applicable bylaws suggested to me, I mean, I did not notice anything about this plan that was not consistent with our bylaws. The setbacks look to be correct for a, a parcel in the commercial district. The minimum lot size is fine. The parking spaces I think are fine. Um, I did, basically I, I went item by item and everything looked fine to me and they did submit a letter from the state about their curb cut, approving their curb cut onto Route 510. So I didn't see anything here of concern. Any other observations or comments about this plan? Could could you? Sh they sent something about the lighting, and I apologize. I oh sure. That. Let me. Um. Very good, Judy. Let me bring that up. And just. Supplemental letter on October 13th. Okay. All right, so we, I conveyed to them that they needed to address signage and lighting and the curb cut. So I, it again seems like from the lighting should be fine, the signage should be fine. I don't see any issues with light pollution, which we know others on five, five ten in the commercial I, I district. They didn't send a sample of the light they would use. I assume I think we should ask to ensure that it be pointed down. Okay. Take it, Sarah. Still, nobody potentially from this company has appeared. Nobody's waiting. All right. 
They have full confidence in us to do our job without their input. Well, anything else about this plan that we want to discuss during this part of the public hearing? We have the input from, I mean, so far what I've noted is uh, some, and I'll, I'll put up, once I close the public hearing, I'll bring up a, uh, a word template and we can work together on the key points of the, the key conditions for the site plan approval. But I heard about lights pointed down. We had the piece about the historical commission and about the uh, Board of Health. Other than that, this all looks, this all looks fine. Do you wanna see uh, maybe, uh, there was one more building plan that I can share. Building layout in case people wanna look at that. Let's see. So it looks like a <coughs> building. Three garage bays, two offices, two bathrooms, a kitchen. Didn't see anything in the uh, to the extent we look at these kinds of buildings and make assessments of whether they are in or out of character of the neighborhood, this seems perfectly fine. People know where this is. It's right across from the USI concrete. And I kind of did the Google Street View and looked around. Uh, they're not doing any lands. They have not proposed any landscape screening from a butters and at the same time, I don't see that there's just judging from that particular area on State Road, it didn't strike me that there was particular demand for landscape screening, short of an abutter insisting upon it. There is a residential house kitty corner across the street, but no one is here. Yeah, and I don't know that you know, this is not supposed to create a lot of traffic. I don't know that you would screen such a property from a somebody located, as you say, sort of diagonally across the street. But I didn't see see much need to worry about you know, any other any other the kinds of the kinds of conditions that we put on other plants around town. So it seemed fine to me. Tom, how do you feel about this? I, I think it's fairly straightforward uh, with the, con the conversation, within the context of the conversation we just had. Okay, Sarah? I agree with Tom. There isn't anything that pops out. Yes, the lighting and we need to have the other commissions. Comments. Okay. So shall I close the public hearing? Do, is that, I, I forget, is that something one just does or do we vote to close the public hearing? Judy, you're muted, so. You're still muted, there you are. I think that unless there's an objection or somebody anxious to continue talking, all you have to do is close it. Okay. And I'm closing the public meeting at 5.21 p.m. All right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, uh, let's see, how do I I'm change my share? Give me one second, folks. I'm, what I wanna do is make a copy of our, uh, the letter we use, the form letter we use when we, when we write these conditions. And then I'll bring it up on my screen 
Second, I find it. There's there. It's here. Uh, Select the file name. Okay. I'm open Word. And I will new share of uh, You sure? There we go. Good. Okay. So this is going to be type one properties. C. We'll get that done. I'll fill in all those other details later. Okay. So We always have the, the standard must receive approvals from all of the boards and committees. We'll add the um, septic system plan must receive approval from the Waitley Board of Health. Is that right, Judy? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, exterior lighting must be oriented to point downwards and minimize light pollution. How about that? And impact on the butters. And to, to minimize light pollution and impact on others. Just to tidy that up, Brad, and put a comma after downwards, eliminate the end and uh, put uh, after light, minimize light pollution, then, then you've got a coherent sentence. Exterior lighting must be oriented point downwards, uh, minimize light pollution and, uh, or how about like that? And now you need the end back. Minimize both light pollution and adverse. I'm so, oh, what are you saying I'm missing here? Minimize light pollution and adverse impact on abutters. Well, I think if you want to make one last pass at it, um, okay. point downwards to minimize light pollution and and, and, and um, um, adverse impact on the butters. Must be oriented to downwards, downwards like in to, order to minimize light pollution? Sure. And the adverse impact, or any, any adverse impact. Any. You can tell we've got too much time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have any happies to change to glads here. Uh, and I guess, well, this is exactly the language requested by the Historical Commission. Okay. So take a long, careful look at that language because our next public hearing is four minutes off. And must receive approvals from all appropriate boards and committees. Septic system plan must receive approval from the Board of Health. Exterior lighting must be oriented. <coughs> oriented. How about just oriented downwards? in order to minimize light pollution and any adverse. I move we accept the site plan or grant the site plan, accept the site plan subject to these conditions. Second. Uh, 
Okay, motion has been made and seconded. We'll do a roll call vote. Judy? Aye. Tom? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Brant? Aye. And Don? Not present. Okay. Um, I will work with Don to get this um, over to the applicant. I don't know whether he can sign that or not. You might check with Amy. Uh, yeah, because he wasn't here, so. Um, but he is the chair, so he would, he can, you can make an argument that he can reflect the vote or. or I will have that conversation. That he, I, I don't know, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I will. I always enjoy my visits down to town offices, so I will take this up with them. Very good. So, it looks like I see Tris, John Hammer's iPhone. I don't see any Judy as our kind of parliamentarian. 528 for a 530 public hearing. Can we open it two minutes early? Well, you can, but I don't think you can say anything substantive. That I don't think anybody can say anything substantive till five thirty. So it's sort I'm of damned happy if you do it. Damned if you don't. Minute and a half, if it makes really? any difference. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we won't. God knows we wouldn't want to say anything substantive for two minutes. Um. Let's see. And we don't really have enough time to do even slip in an approval of minutes to be efficient. You could ask if anybody has any objection to making the wording that the historical commission proposed a standard condition of, of site plan review. Well, I think that's I think that's a fine discussion to have. I'm good with that. I mean, it's easy to just leave in our sort of template. Any should does anyone want to see that language again, or you're good with it, Tom? Uh, I, I can make a motion to move that we accept that language. Do it. I just did. Okay. <laughs> Who'll second that motion? I'll second that. All right. Motion made and seconded. Roll call vote. Uh, Judy. Aye. Sarah. Aye. Tom. I grant is I. All right, so we will uh, accept that language as a standard inclusion in all future site plan approvals. I have to make sure to convey that to tight line just to make sure they really understand though. And I have the impression that they're a little bit new to this whole I, thing. I and think that that's not much of an issue in their case because that land was so heavily worked over for building I-91. When the mm -hmm. Historical Commission re talked about this, they said, well, they might find Jimmy Hoffa there, but they didn't think they would find any <laughs> archeological. Okay. Thing. If you wait long enough, isn't anything archeological? <laughs> yes. <laughs> really, really. Well, how exciting. 5.30 has rolled around, oh, 5.31. So I'm opening the public hearing on a debilitating medical condition treatment center's application to install horticultural lighting for indoor marijuana cultivation at its Seven River Road greenhouses. Uh, Sarah, you're going to give Chris screen sharing permission. Good to go, Chris. Chris. The floor is yours to update us on your plans. Very good. Um, so as a, most of you know by now, uh, I'm Chris Chamberlain, civil engineer with Berkshire Design Group. Um, I'm here with the Debilitating Medical Treatment Centers, Inc. team, which from here on out, I'll refer to as DMCTC to save myself the trouble. Uh, Jared Glansberger and John Hanmer. Um, and this is a site I know most of the board's pretty familiar with, and I know some of you have had the chance to be out there at different times over the last couple of years. This has developed. 
Um, but just to ensure that we're all on the same page, uh, we'll start just by showing um, on Mass Mapper um, this location on River Road, uh, which is right on the Hatfield town line. Um, this is the now former um, CNA repair shop on the corner here, um, and the nurse farm complex up here. And we are focused um, on this piece of land here, which is a, a large agricultural flag lot with a frontage of River Road, um, uh, running back to a woods line composed of uh, multiple farm fields. This, of course, is the previous, the pre-development condition, um, but sort of more relevant is to bring up the proposed site plan um, and just sort of uh, setting the table and looking back. Uh, this site, uh, we came to you for the first time um, a little bit uh, earlier than this point in time in, the, in 2020, two years ago, uh, with a request for site plan approval for a proposed outdoor marijuana cultivation facility, uh, which was to include um, three areas of outdoor marijuana grow space um, in these shaded regions here to sort of halfway back uh, along the property, omitting an area that's precluded from us due to wetlands, um, and then a third uh, yeah. agricultural area away in the back, um, as well as um, a few uh, facilities toward the, the front of the site, um, including what were originally 12 individual and now two um, larger greenhouses, uh, that change being amended uh, as a minor change somewhere along the line, um, and three support buildings uh, in this location for uh, storage, drying of, of product, um, uh, nurse, uh, nursery for the young plants, um, and just a, a place to, to house equipment and whatnot. Uh, there's an there's a pre-existing farmhouse uh, which remains on the site and is used for administrative purposes. Um, an existing uh, driveway into the site was realigned a little bit. You can see in the background how the original residential driveway came in and had a sharp curve on it. So following a similar alignment, but a little bit better for the, the commercial operation here, uh, realigned gravel, uh, gravel sort of access area. Um, and parking space. Um, and all of those things that I've just outlined were part of the approved plan or were um, slightly modified as in the case of the greenhouses by a minor amendment. Uh, we also came by with a minor amendment um, to allow phasing of this project. So at the current point in time, the outdoor fields have all pretty much been built out. And as I understand it, we're at or near 100% production in the last season. Um, this greenhouse one has been constructed uh, and is operational. Greenhouse two is not constructed yet. Um, and that, again, that modification from not too long ago uh, was just to allow uh, greenhouse two to go unconstructed for no more than a two year period of time, but to allow some additional uh, temporary container structures to be located within that same footprint uh, as DMCTC continues to grow um, into the site. Um, and then there's a couple of other odds and ends that have not been built yet, which uh, a couple of which we are going to um, touch on in just a moment as those have come up in some of the conversations with a few of the abutters uh, that DMCTC's had since this application came in. But we'll, we'll put a pin in that for just a moment. Um, Chris, just a quick question. Yes. As I recall in the original plan, green, the greenhouses, there was to be no horticultural lighting. They were, I somehow I remember them being yes. at, at a time um, sort of described as hoop houses or things like that. But I am about 30 seconds away from, from getting into that right. and particularly good. on that distinction that brings us here tonight. So good. Very, very, very good in anticipating. Right. Yeah. Um, and our, I actually did have one up because I know Keith had a question that the gravel road you mentioned, that is, um, the one depicted here on this plan, that is that now exists, correct? What you're saying is that the the original shot you called it, I think, a residential road, um, dirt road that had the sharp elbow um, 
that's no longer being used. There's a current gravel road following the, the, the lines you show on this plan in place today. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, and so um, uh, this site, the site plan drawings that were submitted are identical um, to the last versions that you've seen. Um, now, in some of those amendments, we only submitted uh, certain sheets uh, that were relevant to the changes, but ultimately the last version of each of these sheets that you've seen is what's shown here, um, because as far as the application was concerned, the only change to the site was going to be the proposal to hang horticultural lighting in these two greenhouses. And so to back up a little bit, when we came to the board in 2020, uh, the land use that we were proposing was outdoor marijuana cultivation. Um, and at that time, the bylaw had some ambiguity over exactly what was you know, the definition of outdoor cultivation. It didn't explicitly state what that might be. Um, so our proposal, which was ultimately accepted by the board, was to defer to the can to State Cannabis Control Commission uh, definition for outdoor, which is essentially the um, growing of marijuana without the use of supplemental light. So essentially only using sunlight to grow the mature plants, with the one exception that there is an allowance for light to be used for the uh, for the um, the baby plants <laughs> is the, the word that I'd use um, okay. to allow propagation. But the actual growing of the mature plants was entirely by sunlight. So, so that's, time, that's yes, in the nursery, Chris, right? The... Correct. Okay. Yes, exactly. Um, and so subsequently, and perhaps because of this project, um, the zoning bylaw was updated to be very explicit as to what constitutes indoor versus outdoor marijuana cultivation. And so that bylaw now reads, I think I cited this in the narrative, so I might as well just read it directly. Um, the growing of marijuana inside any greenhouse or any other fully enclosed structure and any subsequent drying of marijuana in such a facility. Uh, meaning that at this time, uh, we have a legally existing but non-conforming use because the use that was approved as outdoor marijuana cultivation is now defined as indoor. Um, and then additionally, uh, DMCTC, in order to, to make the most of this property, which thus far, you know, they, they've got a successful operation going, um, would like to take the plunge and just fully um, uh, operate these greenhouses as indoor grow facilities, uh, complete with horticultural lighting. But of course, we can't um, get that approval from the CCC without um, an explicit approval, without an explicit um, special permit allowing it. Um, so, which is why we are here today. Um, and so then through Chris, did this... you mean special permit or a site plan? Well, I'm sorry. So this is site plan review, which is then required for the special permit that we'll be going for with ZBA um, okay. next week. Uh, what the state is concerned about is that we have a special permit before they'll issue a license um, for the indoor cultivation. Um, so the town cares that we get a site plan review in order to have a special permit. The state cares that we have the special permit. So it's a little um, uh, ambiguous, my words there, sorry. Um, and so then um, since this site plan has been submitted, uh, there were some abutters that have reached out to DMCTC. And uh, you know, I think uh, my understanding is that that uh, Tim Smith, it looks like, was is on the call. Um, the immediate abutter had already been having some conversations. Um, just a couple of uh, minor notes have come out. Um, so the site plan as approved and as I submitted it um, includes landscape screening along the northern property line between the fence that encloses the outdoor fields and this northern property line. Uh, which had been proposed to be a mix of a couple of species of holly um, and river birch uh, uh, to, to create that screening uh, as something, you know, a little bit more uh, diverse than the soldiers of arborvitae that you often get on, on sites when they ask for screening. Um, the, the abutter to the north expressed some concern about how large those plants would get uh, as they matured and potentially creating some shading impacts to their fields. Um, so unbeknownst to Chris Chamberlain, there'd been some uh, conversations going on as to what might be a more appropriate way to 
allow for that screening to happen. Um, and you know, we certainly have uh, some thoughts on the landscape architecture side as to what that might be. Um, but bottom line is, I think that while not reflected on these plans, what we'd request if the board should approve the site plan would be a condition that would allow some flexibility so that we can have plants that are you know, enough to screen this uh, fencing from all of the abutters to the north while also ensuring that we've got things that are short enough um, so that they don't create those shading impacts. Um, and then we also had uh, some neighbors from a little bit further up uh, Seven River Road sort of checking in on, on these plans um, and, and compliance with them and noted that um, the existing plans have been showing a guardhouse um, as part of the, uh, the sort of fence and, and access into the site, uh, which at this point in time has not been constructed yet. Um, and, you know, DMCTC's uh, reported that, you know, the, the police department's um, been, you know, active at the site, checking in with the security team that's uh, available 24 hours and on site when the facility is open. Um, and everybody seems pretty happy with that, um, that arrangement at this time. Um, and so again, just sort of to have on record, what we'd love is the ability to, you know, still have the uh, possibility of building that guardhouse uh, should it be appropriate, but uh, you know we defer, to, hopefully defer to the police department as to whether it's entirely necessary to to, to leave that as as a flexible part of the site plan. Um, additionally, and I think this goes a little bit to one of Brant's earlier questions, there was a comment that came in from the highway department. Um, about this uh, driveway as it relates to the town driveway standards. Um, I did take a look into those and, uh, you know, from what I could tell, um, you know, the, the one standard that we don't meet on this plan is that there's a requirement for a paved apron at the end of the driveway. Um, it, to my eyes, there weren't any um, issues with the width or alignment or the grade or anything like that. Uh, but the bottom line is certainly if there are any concerns about the driveway as it is, I, I imagine that DMCTC has no problem um, updating that to the town standards if there are a couple of spots where it falls short. Um, and then, you know, finally, I know, I know you folks very much enjoy listening to me talk and talk and talk and talk for a long time. Uh, but in this case, um, what we've you know noted in the narrative and sort of an acknowledgement that while we are here for a site plan review for a new land use, um, as I think I've highlighted, the physical changes to the site are quite minimal. And even as we look at the permitting standards that are in the zoning bylaw, um, for the most part, uh, the compliance of this plan with those standards is identical to what was proposed before. Um, so in the narrative, we sort of abbreviated our, our point by point um, discussion of those standards. And so right now I'm just gonna you know, highlight the couple that we saw um, that, the, that this new application um, would, would touch on at all. Um, and so, you know, uh, the first of those being lighting and security. Uh, while the exterior lighting is not proposed to change, we are proposing to put um, horticultural lighting in the greenhouses. Um, and much uh, as is the case today with the nursery, um, those greenhouses are to be outfitted with full blackout curtains. Um, that's not just to be good neighbors, although certainly um, that it's important that we not be creating nuisance light at night. Um, but in fact, the plants themselves need a blackout period during the summer growing season when the days are long. Um, and, and so that's uh, a typical uh, setup in these greenhouses. Last time we were here on that note, um, the board made us aware that there had been a complaint about this nursery shining light uh, late into the night on, on uh, it, sat, it wasn't clear if it was more than one occasion, it sounded like maybe just one occasion. Uh, DMCTC looked into that, it seems as though, so current, or I'm not going to say current, that at the time I discussed it with my client, uh, the operation of the blackout curtains in that structure were manual. And so it was someone's job at the end of the day to close them. And on that particular night, that simply didn't get done. 
Uh, since then, um, uh, they've been working on installing automatic timers so that that's not something that needs to be manually done anymore. Um, and the plan for the greenhouses is also to have those blackout curtains on timers. So there's no, no need for human fallibility to come into um, the, the issue of blacking out the lights. Um, in terms of noise and odor, you know, we see this as a negligible change, but uh, the purpose of, um, you know, the agricultural lighting is to allow for a little bit um, more intensity of grow in these greenhouses during periods of, of low light in the winter months. Um, so certainly uh, there's, there's more grow area, there's more need to be running the odor control mechanisms that are already planned for those greenhouses. Um, so in, on, the no, on the odor side, um, you know, the, the system that we have was designed for these greenhouses to be fully loaded uh, with plants. That's still the case. They'll run a little bit more often, and so there, there would be a negligible, negligible change to the, to the noise profile in terms of duration, but not intensity. Um, and then just I'm um, sort of going in order. The next one is really the big one that changes, which is the energy efficiency. Um, that standard is exempt for um, an outdoor grow. Um, so in this case, um, I, you know, tried to explain um, the energy approach for these greenhouses, and you know, the the standard is a little open ended. So uh, as as any engineer does, um, tried to look for an objective measurement there. Um, and so what we looked at was well, this, the Canvas Control Commission. Um, obviously has uh, a ton of um, energy requirements and submissions and things um, that, that need to be addressed. And ultimately, the, the big uh, standard that these indoor grows are held to is really around the lighting um, and the, the density of power is, is how they factor it into that lighting. Essentially, how much power are you using to light these greenhouses? Um, divided by the square feet of plants um, and to create a density of power usage. So per square foot of plant, how much power are you using? And so we looked at the, um, the lights that are uh, proposed to be in there. The, there are in each bay of these greenhouses, 27 horticultural lights, each of them uh, consuming a thousand watts. Um, and so if you, and and then within those greenhouse bays, we have three what what we've referred to as columns of plants, you know, uh, long stretches of tables measuring five foot by 70 foot or uh, about 1050 square feet of of plants per bay. And, you know, if you work all of that math out. Uh, the, the wattage per square foot of lighting is a little less than 26 watts per square foot. And then uh, next step was we threw the mechanical power in there too. Uh, got some information from the mechanical engineer that's been engaged in this project um, to provide the equipment that's going to be running in these greenhouses. Um, and that uh, power draw is a little, a little over 10,000 watts per bay, again, divided by that same uh, plant square footage, worked out to be about an additional 10 watts of um, of power uh, per square foot. Add those together, you get a, a total power density of 36 watts per square feet. And it just so happens that the CCC standard for lighting density is 36 watts per square foot. So the bottom line is that, that based on the proposed plan, the total power per square foot of plant of these greenhouses is uh, actually equal to what the state says is an appropriate level for lighting. Um, uh, so again, just sort of looking for some kind of objective power, so uh, objective um, statement as, as to how we're, we're trying to meet that. Um, and then, you know, overall, uh, the, um, the indoor grow in the greenhouse, I've worked uh, on projects that are both greenhouse and, and inside. Um, there's a tremendous 
difference in, in complexity and intensity of some of the equipment in some of these facilities. And, you know, the big deal with the greenhouse is, you know, there, there's an obvious one, which is that we're using the sun as much as we can, and that offsets the need to use lights. Those numbers that I was recording is the maximum uh, when all the lights are going uh, density, but, you know, large periods of time through the summer where, where that uh, lighting is, is minimal or non-existent. And then, the other issue with the indoor is then taking all the heat that's generated from those lights and evacuating it to keep temperature control. And you know that process is extremely simple in the greenhouses um, because we can uh, very efficiently um, vent uh, all of these spaces um, to remove excess heat in the summer um, uh, in order to do that uh, with much less power than some of the HVAC systems that we see going in in the, in the true indoor closed um, building, uh, indoor grow facilities. Um, and then uh, the last one that I wanna to touch on, uh, water efficiency, again, minor changes, but uh, with you know, more lights and sort of an expansion of the grow operation in this footprint, throughout the year, uh, some more water uh, will be consumed. Uh, the peak daily use of water wouldn't change because that has always been um, occurring at the height of summer uh, when the plants are, are growing vigorously and we've got heat and direct sunlight um, eva rapidly evaporating water from them. And of course, the, the large user of water um, on this site is going to be during dry conditions when these entire fields are filled up and there is absolutely no change on that. Um, and, you know, again, the, the, the uh, facility uh, continues to have uh, uh, somewhat sophisticated uh, water usage uh, equipment that's monitoring soil moisture and, and trying to uh, drip irrigate just exactly the amount of water uh, that the plants need to uptake to minimize waste, uh, both of water and, and of nutrients. Um, and then um, flipping through, you know, uh, in the application, we included um, some of those nuts and bolts um, uh, requirements as to just clearly identifying the applicant and the landowner um, and everything like that. Um, and then, you know, the requirement on the host community agreement uh, uh, that did not require a change. The host community agreement um, allowed for marijuana cultivation on this um, site, but didn't specify between indoor and outdoor. Um, so that is sort of a summary of what we've submitted um, and certainly happy to uh, address any further questions the board may have. Okay, very good. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I guess we'll start with comments or questions from, um, actually maybe what we should do is since we have some members of the public here, I think it, Tim is still here. So I wanna just see if members of the public that I know if Keith is still here, I wanna just make sure we hear from the highway department regarding that uh, uh, the driveway. So first, any comments from the public? Tim, are you still out there? Yep, I am. Okay. Um, my biggest concern when I, I heard this was how much light was coming out of that those grow houses, but if they're all going to be their uh, blackout curtains like they have in the nursery, that that seems to cut it down quite a bit. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about that anymore. Okay. Um, I do have an issue on the driveway because it seems to be the mouth of it seems to be creeping north um, a little bit. With the I think it started with the site work, the heavy trucks coming in couldn't make the turn and kept cutting it off a little bit into my front yard, but. Those are, those are really all I have to say. Okay. So you're, just to make sure I heard you clearly, Tim, yep. that you are concerned that the northern edge of the driveway, that maybe just because of the way people are turning onto the property, they're basically starting to encroach on, you know, on your side of the property line. Is that? Yeah, I, it was, I think it was the trailer dumps that came in in the beginning, just where you know, just didn't take a wide enough turn. Yeah. Just kept cutting it, so. So there might be an argument there to move to the, I mean, I understand, Chris, that this is an existing driveway and now that we might talk about. And I believe, Keith, you had a concern 
about the proximity of the curb cut to the property line, but maybe I'll, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pipe in at this point in time. Um, the existing driveway that was there previously with the Rawls family it was a non-conforming driveway. In other words, it didn't meet our driveway regulations, select board regulations. Primarily the, the one thing is the, and I don't have them in front of me, I think it's number four or five in the selectman's regulation that all driveways 20 feet, need to be 20 feet from our property line. This clearly doesn't meet that. Um, it does as it goes in away from the road, but out near the road, it doesn't. And then the other thing that, that Chris also mentioned is that you know our current driveway regulations require a paved apron. Um, when you, especially you get heavy trucks in a lot of um, vehicles like that would be going in and out of this are turning in and out when we only have gravel, a gravel driveway with no apron, what ends up happening is the edge of the edge of the town pavement starts to break away and, and it starts to work its way into the travel, you know, towards the travel lane. So that's why um, we require that. It's very common, same thing if you were to put a driveway on, on a state highway, they require it. Other towns, it's, it's, it's almost standard practice to have to put a paved apron on it. Um, we never, you know, our, our regulations stay, um, I think it says eight feet. I don't, we, I never go out there with a tape measure and measure it. So a lot of times a contractor will, will just put an apron in and they do it in, they do it by hand. They don't have to bring a paving machine in. And so mm -hmm. if it's, if it's in the general vicinity, that's, that's always been fine by us. We don't, come out there and specifically make sure it's right down to the same, to the inch. But those are the two things. And, and by moving, by, by putting the driveway, moving it away from, from the Smith property, that will definitely address the, you know, the fact that they're turning and um, driving on his property. Uh, another reason why that requirement is, was put in front way back in the nineties was for the simple fact of, you know, when you have snow removal in the winter time, and if the neighboring landowner has um, shrubs or whatever, and, and, and you come in and you plow the snow and you destroy property, you know, it's, it was, it was put in there for protection on, on, you know, for both parties involved. Thank sure. you. Um, so yeah, I just want to so make sure, sorry to interrupt. Chris, no, I just want to make sure that I've clearly heard what you were recommending, Keith. So it sounds like number one, um, and I'll, then I'll ask for Chris's feedback, but um, number one, uh, acknowledging that the, the pre-existing driveway was non-conforming, uh, you would request that the new driveway in its entirety may be made conforming with respect to uh, maintaining at least a 20 foot setback from the property line. Is that, is that, that's a fair statement number one? Yes. And again, that's the, you know, the, our, the way things normally are handled with me is that because it's a selectman's regulation, if a, if an applicant comes to me and can't meet our regulations, then I deny it. And then they have the opportunity to appeal to the select board. And that is not, it's, while it's not common, it's not uncommon it, and it does happen. And there are lots of reasons why an applicant will say, well, for instance, in this case, I can't meet the 20 feet. Sometimes it's because of wetlands or there's always sometimes good reasons why they can't do it. But at the same point in time, um, that would be something that I, I think in the fact of this is such a change to the property from what was there, it, it warrants bringing it into up to standards. If this was a simple thing of the house that was there being sold to another residence 
and and still being a res just a residential house the that existing driveway would just go on as it is because it would be sort of like grandfathered yeah yeah so we have the sort of moving sort of reorienting the 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 driveway and i see that you've marked chris on a point at which i think you mean 18 feet that that 18 foot mark yeah your cursor move your cursor a little bit up that 18 foot is what is that the distance from, that's the that's width the, of the driveway the width i'm sorry the width of the driveway not the distance of the northern edge of the driveway from the property line right Correct. all right so keith is suggesting that we would want to move that driveway <laughs> somewhat to the south so that it so that it could stay you no know, at least 20 feet away from uh, the northern property line, and that that you also have a eight, roughly eight foot paved apron. So would that be doable? Yeah. So I would defer to DMCTC to commit to that. But uh, to my mind, that's a relatively small amount of work. Uh, my one question would be as to whether they have any obligations related to this field and not disturbing it. I'm, I'm not aware of that, but um, be good to hear. I see. So should we hear from Jared on that? Jared or John? Yeah, okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that seems fine. That seems totally doable. Okay. Because I think Keith is making an excellent argument for the rationale for the apron. And given the fact that already the proximity of the driveway to the northern, you know, northern property line is starting to, you know, have an adverse impact on the butter. I think it would be reasonable for us to insist on those two changes. Yeah, I, I agree with right. all of that. We when we put these plans together, we always carefully go through zoning, but unfortunately I did not then cross-reference the select board regulations. Otherwise we might have picked up on that. So I apologize for that. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, this is a good just a quick question for you, Keith. Are those regulations available in an electronic form online? Because I was looking for them. Yeah, they're available on the town's website. They are. I actually have them pulled up here and was following along. Okay. Somebody, maybe I'll have to ask you offline, Keith. I, I did a quick search and I somehow didn't find them on the town's website. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. All right. Um, other comments from the public? If there's any more public about this plan. Okay. Um, comments from the board before we close a public hearing? Sarah. I want to make sure I'm unmuted. Um, part of our, our reasoning for the electrical or the energy usage was sort of promoting or pushing for alternative sources. So there is no proposition, no proposal for alternative energy sources looking down the long-term road of yeah, minimizing um, usage. Right, and uh, that's the primary yes. Um, I didn't highlight this, which was on the original plan, is there's an existing small, it's it's admittedly small, there's an existing solar array that's, that's intended to stay. Um, I think there's potential from a solar access standpoint um, on the existing house. Uh, there's still, you know, sort of structural questions there. And I think at this point, DMCTC doesn't have a lot of clarity on the exact long-term use of the house and whether there could be any conflicts there. Um, and other than that, you know, we, we do have um, land, even this land in here is both, has both wetland impacts um, as well as currently is agricultural land um, and, you know, other, other locations nearby where that uh, use is going to be is all really farmable land or wetlands. So the, um, the ability to site anything significant is limited. Yeah. Again, with the priority being, and, and I think this is noted in the body like two related to solar that 
that land that can be farmed, it's desirable to see that to continue to have uh, plants grown on it as opposed to, to solar. But it also, it also suggests dual use solar. Sure, oh, that's, that's fair. Could you presumably you can't put solar arrays on the top of your greenhouses? Um, correct. Yeah, and it, in fact, even um, uh, uh, indoor grows that are in buildings, which certainly do have roofs and do put solar panels on, um, it's it's not even close to what they would get by just letting the sun shine through the roof. Right. Right. Sarah, right. I think you had could you more? comment on? I'm sorry. I just want to say I thought Sarah had still had a follow up. No, just whether what other if, if there's other efficiencies. Okay. Chris, you gave the um, wattage that's being put up, but you didn't give any projected use figures. Um, you must have some idea of how often these lights would be turned on. Yeah, um, I think uh, that goes a little bit to operations. So I'm hoping that that John can give us some um, information on that. And I, um, yeah, so, to some extent, I'm, I'm struggling as as the dirt engineer to try to talk about the electricity a little bit. The dirt engineer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's going to depend on the time of year, um, but essentially, the plants need 18 hours of light a day when they're vegging. And then they need 12 hours of light a day uh, when they are in flower. So that means two things. Uh, essentially, first, it's seasonally dependent. Uh, so in the summertime, you know, we may only be running those lights for a couple hours, quite literally. Like we might be adding a two extra hours of growth time, right? So those lights might be on for two hours a day. We might. I mean, it, it's uh, something we would need to develop as far as, as far as optimizing plant growth, right? That's a little bit R&D, um, but essentially it's, there may be two hours of the day where there's actually no sun shining, where those blackout curtains will be shut and we'll turn those lights on. As the season changes, as the sunlight drops during the day and as the sunlight goes away during the day, we then need to constantly make adjustments um, uh, so that peak usage would be in the winter time, obviously, uh, in December, where um, we'll need to be turning those lights on, you know, they'll need to be on between, I mean, we utilize the day as much as we can. Um, there might be some supplemental lighting going on during the day as well, um, but um, you know, those lights could be on uh, for, you know, I guess I should, you know, just a conservative estimate, I guess we can assume in their peak usage hours in the wintertime would be 18 hours. Some of it might be during the day when there's light, but we want to supplement some of that light. And then obviously we need to extend the day to a full 18 hours so that those plants don't um, turn to flower. Um, so it's variable. Um, uh, so could but I, I guess sure. that the general terminology is uh, as far as our approach to lighting our plants. If if we don't finish tonight, it would be helpful if you came back with a with a rough estimate of what this might work out to over time, because otherwise I'm going to be kind of forced to think about a straight average between two and eighteen, which might not be too far off, but would probably be uncomfortable with but that's a heck of a lot that's a heck of a big increase over the existing use and the bylaw does request or hope anyway strongly urge 50 percent of any additional use be generated it says on site but it occurs to me that where the company owns more than one site it might might be feasible since since the legislature is now allowed uh, sharing across parcels to build on some of your other buildings. And certainly, I think you should be looking at building on 
dual use on that agricultural land, solar. In fact, I think you probably have to build dual use solar on, on agricultural land. If it's high quality land, you won't get, well, I guess you can do it privately. You wouldn't get any incentives for doing it if you were applying for special incentives from the state. You might get incentives from the state for doing dual use solar. I suppose okay. that I was coming at this, I, I mean, I was similarly, I don't know, contemplating the significantly, the potential for significantly increased electrical use. And, you know, not being an electrical engineer, sort of under, I know we tend to take surrounding uh, infrastructures for energy delivery somewhat for granted. I, I guess I thought I would ask the question as, as, you know, what have you done to ascertain that the electrical grid that serves this facility with its increased electrical demand would be adequate to meet your electrical demand without having adverse impacts on, you know, others sharing those same electrical segments. Like I could, Imagine again, naively being worried if I were in a butter and you know we're all kind of feeding off the same electrical power lines, um, you know, are my lights going to flicker? That sort of thing. Like I said, that very naive question, but I would have to believe that as a you know professional operation, you would have looked into this question of the necessary infrastructure to meet your um, you know, electrical demands. Can you comment on that at all? So I'll defer to John and Jared on conversations that have been had with the utility, but um, just from experience with other projects, including other projects in Waitley yet to have been built, that Eversource is not shy about denying electrical service if their um, grid in that area does not have the capacity. Good, I'd like to hear from Jared or John. Go ahead. Great. So uh, we, we've already paid for an upgrade to the line from North down to seven and actually now down to three River Road. So we have uh, we have paid for an upgrade from uh, single phase power up to three phase power uh, for all of our neighbors. And there is uh, sufficient power already uh, now available at seven to satisfy both the west greenhouse and the east greenhouse. So there is no, there is already enough power on site to, to turn these lights on today. Okay, all right. And it's so, actually, please say a little bit more about the nature of these upgrades and how that's benefited um, the neighbors, as you said, Jared. Uh, well, I mean, so it's just a difference in uh, in the nature of single phase versus three phase power. So three phase power is a is a more stable uh, form of of power. So we use that, for instance, for our freezer containers, where we need to make sure that there's no, um, you know, there's no real vicissitudes in the uh, in, in the power that's available to them because it's a constant draw to maintain the to maintain the uh, the same temperature. Um, and uh, and so because of our location and the distance uh, from north where it, it, it used to terminate, we, we had to pay to have that uh, three phase wire uh, brought down to uh, first to seven and now to three. Okay. Um, and so all of the power has been upgraded along along the way. Uh, oh, I, 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 I Yeah, I, I can't, I mean, unless somebody was, uh, was, you know, using an outdoor freezer, uh, which I suppose people could, um, you know, I they, they they probably would not have noticed. Okay. Um, other than that, you know, this this power is now available all along the way down. I see. So so really, this now because you needed this service put in place, uh, you've created yeah. an opportunity really all the way from your property up to 116 for anyone who might need access to this kind of 
power to have it without having to pay the additional cost of running it. Yeah, I, I exactly right. Yeah. The, the, the three phase did come to nurse. Um, oh, so it did come not to nurse. Not as if we, we ran sure. the lines all the way right. up to 116. Okay, very good. Thank you. It's, it's good to hear. I just would want to make sure that, again, if I were a homeowner nearby, that I wouldn't expect to have a, you know, cost impact or a usage impact as a result of this nope. new high demand usage nearby. And it sounds like I, nope. I should I should sleep soundly at night on this particular issue. Okay. And you can put a refrigerator in your bedroom, I suppose. Okay. And an electric blanket. Okay. Yeah. No. All right. Very good. Um, I'll just come back to just check back one last time in with Tim, since you seem to be our one, <laughs> our one member of the public. Before I close the public hearing, um, anything new that has crossed your mind before we wrap up this part of the discussion? No, everything is the same as I reported last time. Um, um, the odor is, it's there one minute and then it's gone. It's not overpowering as I thought it would be. Okay. Um, so everything is going good. And as I recall, Chris, your ventilation strategy in the greenhouses right now is again, greenhouse one is the only one there, is that um, airflow is from north to south. Is that correct? Exiting from the south, away um, from the abutter? Having not been the one who built the greenhouses and is not in them every day, I hesitate to answer, although I do believe that's right. correct. I'm sure John would know the answer off the top of his head. So I missed the last part. What was what am I answering? So I was right just, now? John, I was it's, just uh, asking. It, it's east to west. Uh, uh, it's east to west, and it's uh, oh, so yeah, it, it, it sucks out into our field. Oh, I see. That would make sense given the orientation of the plants within the greenhouses. Yeah, I'm now very glad yeah. I didn't try to answer that question. All right. Well, you're just a dirt yeah. engineer, Chris. You're not you an go. air engineer. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Okay, well that's the that's the appropriate orientation to minimize impact on the a butter. Okay. I want to confirm so we were this was just prior plan. This was cropping just during the warmer months of the year. Now you'll be having crops and harvest 12 months out of the year. Yeah, the idea is to be able to um, <clears throat> cultivate year round. So there will be a higher probability of odor in the winter now. Um, so I would answer um, that with yes, um, but exclusively from those portions of the site where the airflow can be controlled and right. is being filtered with the carbon filtration. Right. I think that's a good and, point. And, and I think this was I think this was addressed previously. So our intent was to do um, was to try to grow during the winter months previously, uh, or just to grow year round, but for extract grade, not for flower. Um, and so you know we we would have plants growing in there uh, previously, you know, without the indoor application. Um, as right, a quote unquote right. out, outdoor grow. Um, so there would still have been, uh, you know, assuming uh, hopefully that this is approved, but there would still have been plants in the greenhouse year round. It's just that the quality of the plants would be far inferior over the winter than in the summer months. Thank you. Okay. So this is a question for Judy. I thought I heard a hint in an earlier comment suggesting that we might not be able to just close the hearing and go forward with conditional approval. I want to see if you're thinking that and if so why, meaning that we could we would have to continue the public hearing versus close the public hearing. Or maybe I just we can no, close I, it I, and continue. I would really like to see more information on energy usage projected and a, a, an improved 
plan to try and offset to generate more of that on site or within DM somewhere, some method for saving or tying in with with another uh, energy source somewhere or something, but getting offsets or I'm, I'm quite concerned that that this doesn't satisfy the uh, intent of the bylaw, which was to try and minimize the impact of on energy usage from indoor cultivation. Hmm. And I think also we should be very careful that we don't want additional information from them, from DMCTC before we close the hearing. And could I just ask is, I can't see participants. Is there anybody here for the uh, reg, regula, subdivision regulation hearing? I would assume um, not. I can't was tell, that, I only see, I see that. That was supposed to start at six. Oh, yes, right. So if, if there's nobody here, it's not an issue. Yeah, I don't think there is. Um, Chris, I was before I was surprised at your comment that you needed to have a site plan review before a special permit because we've always thought of it the other way around. And I've never heard that comment before. Um, I guess I didn't mean before. Um, I guess that that part of one of the special permit criteria is that there be site plan approval. Yeah. Um, and my understanding was that, that the order was not relevant. The last time we did this, I think we got the special permit first and then did site plan review. This time we've got yeah. site plan first and then special permit. Well, since I see that there, there's no legal ad posted for the next, next CBA meeting, I don't think there would be any problem with our continuing this hearing. So you're suggesting, Judy, that we continue the public hearing to the next regular meeting of the planning board and we direct DMCTC to, well, certainly come, since if we're, if, if it comes to that, they might as well give us a revised plan showing the change to the driveway. But mm -hmm. primarily you're asking for more information, more details on their energy use plan, and some, you know, some proposal to meet or come close to meeting the intent of the bylaw regarding uh, local energy offsets. Well, to put to put is their there, thinking caps on and see what creatively can be done. Yes, is, is there nothing listed for? November 3rd? I didn't see anything on the agenda, no. Uh, oh, you mean for ZBA? I could be confused, but... I can check now. There, there wouldn't be an agenda there yet, but a legal ad? Well, there would have to be a legal ad posted if... Did you do, did you do a legal ad? No. And it's not posted I, on the website. Oh boy. Well, I'm. Or it wasn't. Yeah. I... Uh, Mary, let's follow up on that tomorrow. Uh, I don't think there's anything to do about it right now. All right. So, Brent, I'd like to second your point that the, if we're going to continue the hearing, uh, that we show the dry, driveway and apron revisions in the next iteration. Yeah, that's fine. We certainly clear, do that. And it would just be clear what plan we're really approving. Right. I mean, I will. I will say that I don't know that I've. Don't I find myself neither strongly endorsing nor strongly rejecting Judy's suggestion about continuing the public hearing. I suppose there's nothing wrong with um, making this request and asking DMCTC to come back in a month's time with um, their best thinking about how to 
yeah, reduce the demand. Really, it's about reducing the demand on infrastructure. I mean, this is, Judy, I think this is the point of the intent. The intent of that clause in the zoning bylaw for, for marijuana is... Yeah, we, we worked very hard at trying to make sure that indoor cultivation wouldn't have uh, as small an environmental impact as possible or as reasonable. And, but I, again, I do want to bring up the point made and contained in the submitted documents that the Cannabis Control Commission sets a, an upper bound of 36, was it watts per square foot um, for just lighting. So the state in regulating energy usage of just lighting has set an upper limit of 36 watts. Their proposal and their analysis suggests that lighting plus mechanical and everything else is 36, meaning that they're already, their, their overall energy demands are well below um, what the state requires. So I'm, I just find myself wondering, like, what are we? I, I would like to step back and say, you know, we, we allowed marijuana cultivation in a lot more places than most communities have. And we worked very hard in doing that to try to see that, that they would be um, not overly impactful on the community or the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think there's sort of a trade-off between those two. Uh, it's the same thing, I think. Um, so I, I'm, the state standards are the state standards. I'm not sure what criteria they used in developing them. I know that they were concerned about energy usage. I don't know how concerned. And I'm not quite sure what that means to us. Mm -hmm. um, just if no, I could I, uh, chip, yeah. chip in for a second. Go I'm ahead, sorry, uh, was that correct? Oh, sorry. Was, yeah, but, just, that's, um, I, I, I just want to make sure that we, we remember too that these are greenhouses and that that standard is for, uh, is for indoor uh, structures that don't make use of the sun. Um, and so as I think John was pointing out that for much of the grow growing year, you know, the use of the, the use of those lights is, is really minimal. Um, and so the, the way that we've approached being efficient with energy is really baked into the structures themselves by, you know, by having transparent roofs, uh, you know, we, we were able to harvest the, the energy of the sun. And so, yes, that's the upper limit that we would use, the 26 watts per square foot of light is the upper limit of what we may use. But as a, as a functional use of energy, we've already baked in a very energy efficient uh, approach to this where we're not in, you know, we're not in an industrial park uh, using, uh, you know, heavy HVAC systems to cool the, the growing space. We're using, you know, we're using... Uh, polycarbonate and, uh, and translucency. I'm uh, very well that, aware of that, that Derek, that and you gave exactly the same arguments when it was ex exterior cultivation. Um, I haven't, you know, what I would like is more information. Can, can you tell us, can you tell us what you, you know, roughly, obviously, weather will impact this and um, temperature and things, but I would be very, I would like to see more information on the actual projected use, not the capacity to, to light, which is what we have now. So I think, you know, with, with a set of assumptions, it's certainly possible to sort of project out an, an annual power use um, and, great. you know, certainly we can come back with uh, a little bit of a feasibility analysis for, for trying to find 
um, additional ways of on-site generation. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, there's some lack of detail there because we just see some limited options, but we can, um, if, if that's uh, what we're that looking be. for, we can, we can do a more detailed analysis. Um, I, I'll, I will just, again, highlight We'll have wetlands constraints where we're not going to be able to touch. And I hear you about um, considering this site over here, which I'll, I can certainly talk to DMCTC about. Um, unfortunately, there's a nice building at Sugarloaf Shops with a roof that ah, points due south. I forgot. I, honestly, I'd forgotten about that one. This That's is quite what a bit of use for the energy, and that is part of what our initial site plan usually is requested. So as this is a change in the energy use as part of the original plan, it would be good to see a new updated plan for the energy usage for this. So I've heard, I think Judy's made her position pretty clear. I think Sarah is concurring that we should continue the public hearing to gather more information about energy use. I just want to check in with Tom to see where he's, as you've heard this, where are you in this, this part of the conversation? Uh, I think we, we should go ahead and do a little more analysis of the energy usage. Um, it, it's, uh, it's only one, one month delay. Um, I think that'll satisfy and satisfy the board's needs to on that that front and as Judy pointed out a lot of effort went into thinking about energy use of these types of facilities and this is an opportunity to test it out okay all right then um so Chris Jared and John do you feel do you have any questions for the board because I want to make sure that if we do you know continue this public hearing you understand what your marching orders are from us. Uh, I think it seems clear to me. I don't know if Jared has, a, has any questions. Okay, that was a pregnant enough pause. Chris, as our leading dirt engineer. Yeah. Um, I think so. I, 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 I'm certainly clear on what the questions are. I, I, my wheels are spinning on, okay. on exactly how to attack the answers. But okay. your, your earlier summary was very good, Chris. Okay. Very good. And, and I think what we're saying is that um, a plan, uh, an energy efficiency or offset plan that involves other properties of DMCTC is within Waitley would be acceptable. Is that a fair statement, Judy? Since you mentioned sugar. Sure, sure. Or, or other approaches even. And be creative, this is. Okay. So now technicality, Judy, um, what is the procedure for continuing the public hearing? We, we, we are requesting more information, so we just we have to announce the uh, time. Okay. We continue. You have to continue to a set time. All right. So, and this is something that we vote on, or uh... no? I think we well. You, you have a consensus. Okay. So I'm just looking at our so our next regularly scheduled planning board meeting is. Tuesday, the 29th of November, which is on, fine with me. So then we are going to, I'm going to, am I making a motion, Judy? No, you just state, you know. All right, we are going to- be the first, the first item on the agenda at 5.05, is that? Okay, so we will continue the public hearing on DMCTC's, um, application to Tuesday, November 29th uh, at 5.05 p.m. Okay. Thank you, Chris, John, and Jared. And just to be clear that the, the, the drawings will have the revised uh, driveway location in the, including the apron. 
Yes, yes, yes. That's that's a pretty small change for me to, to Good. Okay. Uh, so thank you. All right. That. all right. Thank you all. Okay. Um, and since I noticed that um, Larry Brotherton appeared on the call, Larry, um, we went ahead. <clears throat> the hearing on your application was scheduled at 5.05 this evening. We went ahead and did it. There was no represent, you know, we did it all before you joined. So I will email you separately with the draft. Well, why I should, I think since you're on, I should at least show you uh, the draft of what we- um, You should tell him we approve the plan is what you should do. <laughs> okay, well, yes, we have, thank you, Judy. Um, we approved your plan uh, and we put a couple of conditions on the approval which I'll share with you by email, but it had to do with um, making sure that you obtain uh, approval from the Board of Health on your septic system design, number one. Number two, that your exterior lighting is oriented. Now, of course, I can't quickly pull up the, just give me one second to get the wording right. We Go ahead, Judy. We have asked the plan, the Board of Health for approval. It's it needs to come, but Larry doesn't have to get it. In, in other words, Larry doesn't have to submit it to the planning board. Yeah. Well, no, he doesn't have to go ask the Board of Health to do something. We've already done that. Uh, we have a condition that says exterior lighting must be oriented downwards in order to minimize light pollution and any adverse impact on abutters. Because that's been a concern on other commercial properties in town. And actually, I'll just share so you can see what we drafted. This will end up um, being an attachment to our signed site plan approval. Uh, we received feedback from the Waitley Historical Commission about the, well, perhaps unlikely discovery of archeological artifacts or remains, but we added a condition at the Historical Commission's request um, that work any work involving excavation should stop if these kinds of artifacts are discovered. So this, these are the key conditions that are going to appear in your site plan approval. You have any questions for us, Larry? Um, as of right now, I do not have any questions. Thank you for the approval. And I'm sorry I was late. For some reason, I <clears throat> thought it was at 6.05. So I was joining early, but apparently I was incorrect. So I apologize again for that. Okay. Um, I really feel bad for that. So, but as far as the downward lighting on the facility, I don't think that should be a problem at all. Like I stated in my letter, they're going to be, um, they'll be uh, motion censored. So uh, anything that might may go by might set them off. But other than that, we will not be at the facility in the evening. That, that's for sure. So our normal operations are generally between seven and five. Sometimes they run a little bit later, but uh, other than that, that's, that's that. Okay, very good. All right, we'll um, get this material signed and there'll be hard copies made available to you in town offices and you'll get an email from us with an electric electronic copy as well. So we'll let you know electronically as soon as these materials are available for you to pick up. All right, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I really- All right, you're very welcome. Have a great night. You too. Okay. Bye. okay. Um, Don's here. Um, after, a long, after a long and contentious uh, buildings and grounds subcommittee meeting at uh, Tech. Okay. 
Well, we were going to do a public hearing 41 minutes ago on proposed revisions to the Wheatley subdivision re regulations. We're going to still do this, correct, Judy? Sure. Well, but Don, um, I, I am happy to turn over the virtual chairs, chairs gavel to you for this third public hearing. Well, since I don't know where we are, I'll let you go ahead and handle the rest of it. Okay. All right. Well, people will correct me. So we're going to now open at 641 a public hearing to discuss proposed revisions to the Waitley subdivision regulations 234-5. So who can share the revised language on screen? So I don't have that. Read, ready at hand or where I can share it if someone can remind me where to find it. I don't have it. It's one of the files that got, got wiped out. Oh, really? Okay. Do you remember what folder you put it in? I put it in bylaws and regs, but I didn't see it there. I see the APR policy. Driveway permit, scenic. Yeah, I don't see anything there. Um, let's see if it didn't make it online either. So I mean, in the wait, wait there's a okay. I think I found it. It's let me see if this is what you're. Let me see if I can share this document. Uh, proposed amendment. So is this the one, Judy, proposed amendment to the subdivision regulations? That look familiar to you? Yeah, I can't see the whole thing. I can just see. Uh, let me see if I can put it into uh, oh, view. Oh, I see, yeah. Um, Oh, that's too, that's not good. Now that's the first draft, not the second one. Shoot. Uh oh. Uh oh. Let's see. I said we continue this hearing as well. Just, just give me we won't one need to, second. Just give we me won't one. won't need to re-advertise. Hold on. Oh, we won't have to re-advertise. Well, mm -hmm. let me just check one thing before we. Actually, if you've got the agricultural policy, the um, no, there was more changes than that. So I am not easily able to find either an email. Or a, so this is, I'm not able to find a current draft of the subdivision regulations. So, so yeah, Judy, I guess we're gonna have to continue this until we can locate what we're going to be discussing. So we're I gonna- suggest we continue okay. it to 545 on November 29th. Mm. Yeah, 545. Six, six o'clock, 545. Yeah, let's make it six o'clock. I can just imagine that we could spend a chunk of time on uh, the DNCTC energy efficiency plans. Okay. All right, so we're continuing this public hearing to 6 p.m. on November 29th. All right, so I think what, what else is on our agenda? Review and approve minutes. Sound good to people? Okay, um, we had, I guess, three sets of minutes, July, August, and September. Um, just looking for July, both Judy and I reviewed it and provided some de minimis feedback with kudos to Mary. 
Any, so any other comments on July or do I hear a motion to approve July's minutes as amended? Motion to approve. Second, I see Sarah seconding. Roll call vote. Tom? Aye. Sarah? Yes. Judy? Aye. Don? Aye. And Brant is on. Unanimous. Okay. That's July. With thanks, Mary. <laughs> yeah, that was. And then August 30th. Uh, and that was. So again, I reviewed that. Judy, you, you reviewed the August and September. I, I didn't think I could review that because I wasn't there. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah so but I do have I a question. Go for it. Um, in the, at the very end, there's a reference to Hannah, a comment that Hannah made about asking the planning board about a CPC deadline. Oh, you know what? That's... Um, it's not a CPC, it's CPTC. And I'm going to correct that in the minutes. That's the citizens planning citizens. Thank you, because I couldn't think of a CPC deadline that had anything to do with the planning board. In fact, I may not. Do you remember the CPTC stands for Citizens Planning Training Council? Collaborative. Collect Training Collaborative. Training collaborative. All right, very good. So I've corrected that in the draft minutes in OneDrive, Mary, that has my initials in the file. Okay. Name. Okay, very good. So do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of the August meeting as amended and corrected? Judy, Sarah gets the motion. Who gets the second? I'll second. Huh? Oh, Donna seconding. Very good. All right, roll call vote. Sarah? Yes. Tom? Aye. Judy? Abstain. Abstain. Don? Aye. Brant is aye. Motion approved four with an abstention. We move on to the September minutes, which I guess. Both Judy and I reviewed, made a couple of minor corrections. Comments? Anything else? Do I hear a motion to approve the September minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Tom, you weren't there. Second. Oh, you weren't there. Yeah. You weren't. Doesn't, doesn't so, make you know, I've been told that you don't have to be at a meeting to approve the minutes. No, that's true. All you have to do is agree with it. Okay. All right, so Don's gonna get the motion. Sarah's gonna get the second. Roll call vote, Don. Aye. Sarah? Yes. Tom? Aye. Judy? Aye. Grant is aye. All right, unanimous. Thank so you, Mary. Really, really nice work, Mary. Thank you. Um, any other business items that we just couldn't anticipate? Um, are we gonna get a copy of the um, select board letter to Tim Hawkins? Has that been produced yet? You know, I have asked for that and, um, but no one ever sent it to me. So I'll ask again. So this is the select board letter to Hawkins. This is about the Monaghan property and the anonymous complaint. I received I that. It wasn't, I read that. It wasn't via this, because I have seen that. Well, do tell how you got your hands on it. I'm now, oh, maybe it was my neighbor. <laughs> I attended the select board meeting where they discussed it, finalized it, and agreed they were going to send it. But I never, and I requested that we would get a copy, but no one ever sent us a copy. So I'll do I that. Was a little disappointed that the board didn't remember some of the things of 
how we're constrained by our role is just planning and not actually being able to make the by or enforce our bylaws. So hmm. we really can only comment. We can't and make um, conditions. There's yeah. really nothing we can do other than make conditions. Yeah. And I've been thinking ask. about your comments about that, Sarah, and we had been planning on having a phone call with the building inspector, but then this whole thing came up on 71 Chestnut Plain Road, which the vibes I'm getting in my conversations with people at town hall are that it's still very contentious. And there may not be a lot of, well, there's some differing points of view between the town and the building inspector about what can or should be done in that condition. And it seemed like not a, a good moment for me to be having a conversation in general about enforcement. So it's still on my mind. Judy, did you have a question or comment? No, but um, I wouldn't do anything without looking at the special permit. And it's the ZBA who issues the special permit. And I don't know if there was a site plan review or not. Right. And that's and, for 71 Chestnut Plain, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I do know that the, and maybe Grant doesn't, that the neighbor who is objecting is the son in law of the man who sold the property to the current and the business. Or, property to the current owner and uh -huh. he also had plastic business okay. so um, I don't know if that has any relevance or not but Intriguing. but the the permit was probably issued to Paul Florial not to not to the current people so there's one last um, unanticipated piece of business I just wanted to bring up which is um, this our, our norms and processes for um, getting uh, invoices paid. So now this most recently was the third instance where a, uh, an invoice from the Greenfield recorder was of course mailed, physical copy mailed to town offices. I think uh, Amy Lavalle as the administrative assistant collected it dropped the hard copy off in the planning board's mailbox in town offices and sort of assumed that something would be done about it. Um, and there seems to be some confusion around who on the planning board is looking out for these. Um, somebody, the Brian Domina said that somebody on the planning board needs to be um, identified as, I think, instructing or giving approval to the, um, the town accountant about which of these, you know, are these invoices correct and should be paid and so forth. So I, I just wanted to put that out there, like town offices is dropping these things off in our box and expecting us to do something about it. And so far, it doesn't seem that we are. So how do we fix this? Can I just say just... something? <laughs> Mary? I just wanted to say that since I got hired, I was told at the time that these invoices were supposed to go to the town clerk. And I've been thinking all along that that's where they were going. But they're going to, I checked what on the on the actual invoice and they're they're sending it to the planning board on the first line and then the four Sandy Lane address and then care of the town clerk. So I can see why that might be landing in the in the planning board basket. Is it necessary to include the planning board in the address? I mean, I could easily have the recorder just drop it off the address and have it all go to the town clerk or to Amy Lavalley, you know, it, without involving that. It, it'd be really easy for them to see whose bill it is because 
each of the invoices comes with a copy of the ad, which has, you know, the ad is either for a planning board meeting or a zoning board meeting. My understanding of what's going on is that um, these are planning board expenses that need to be paid out of the planning board budget. And somebody on the planning board needs to, somebody who's identified as authorized. So one of the five of us, um, or you, well, I don't know, I suppose Mary, I don't know whether Mary is considered for this purpose, could be authorized to approve these expenses. So that's, a, that I'm a little unclear on, but I don't think we can simply say, oh, just take the planning board's name off the bills and send them to the town clerk and the town clerk will just pay them. The idea is that they have to come to the planning board. Somebody on the planning board has to, apparently somebody, Amy will, Amy LaValle or whoever receives the physical bill will be happy to scan it and email it to a member of the planning board who must then review it and approve it and then I think the town accountant, I have, I'm sorry, I have to look at the email again. Somebody has to provide a wet signature. Yeah. Um, I think on the, ex once the expense is approved. So there's this process, right? Bill comes in, somebody has to review it, says, yep, valid planning board. <laughs> Then somebody, presumably other than one of us citizens on the board, uh, will prepare the whatever documents are needed at town offices to, um, and that's to the, pay the bill. I think, Brent, there are two, two things going on here. One, there's a phenomenon in organizations when the administrative load for the administrative staff starts to, to pile up and the, the hours in the day grow short, they get pushed down into the organization looking for other people to do that work. I got a sense there's a little bit of that going on. Um, the, other, the other point is if, if, if we're gonna go that route and if Mary is in fact in, in processing these uh, to, the, the, to the recorder to wherever these documents are going, uh, can't she be queried by the clerk when they come in, the town clerk when they come in and say, yes, that was um, a planning board expense and authorize the clerk, the, the clerk to go forward with it as opposed to this creating a new layer of paperwork down at the planning board level, which is largely a volunteer, which is a volunteer board. I and think I the, town, the town requires a signature that the from somebody and it can be Mary I know from my experience with the CPC that somebody on the planning board or authorized by the planning board uh, accepts that this done, that that done done Mary Mary can look at the document and say yes we, we acquired this expense and electronically sign off on it and give it to the clerk electronically so it can't be signed electronically, apparently. It requires a wet signature. Even well, does the town have access to like DocuSign? Well, can, can I tell Mary, you? Can Mary sign it? And can you, can you scan documents, Mary? I, I don't have the capability at, at home anymore. Uh, I can run them to, you know, if... If I if I need to do that, I go down to Staples. It's just down the road in Amherst, and it's not a big deal. But you know, as far as timing, I can't do it from the house. Right. I can do all this. So what it means is periodically <clears throat> checking the planning board. Mailbox well, at town. Office. I would actually like them to scan them, but well, that, so we can do that. So we can request that these invoices on receipt are scanned and emailed, say for the record of the planning board email, and then I can make sure that gets over to you, Sarah, for review and approval. 
Yeah, and um, I can verify and you can, because I think Mary, you're at a rather of a distance from town offices compared to Sarah. Actually, get to town offices and physically sign something. That is true. I don't have any reason to be in Waitley except when I used to come in for meetings. Okay. So now it is out of the way. Um, I, don't, I mean, if there's but another way to do it, that, that would work for me. But well, it sounds like Sarah's. I think we've come it's to Mary executes, and executes the process to start with it. She's the one who knows what actually happened. So Sarah's going to have to get Mary sign off to say, "Did we do this?" Well, I See, already. This is getting, at. This is getting when, when, when I when I get the proof so that I can check it for errors it comes with an invoice. Sometimes that invoice changes if there's a correction to the proof, but ultimately I have an electronic version of the bill itself, which is the body of the email. And there's an attachment of the ad that goes with it. I can certainly send that to Sarah. And I also have been emailing the applicants once I know the amount that's due for their ad to tell yeah. them how much they owe, what it's for, the fact that they have to pay it before we can open the hearing, that sort of thing. And we I've forgot been, that today, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sending that, uh, uh, copying Amy Schrader on that also. And then uh, when Amy gets the payment, she lets me know, but you know that lets her know to expect the payment and she keeps an eye out for it. And she lets me know when it's been paid by email. Um, that's. If you just copy me on all those and then yeah. I'll know that I can legitimately sign and make sure they get paid and onto the warrant. Okay. So copy Sarah on those two things, the, the bill yeah. with the ad proof attached and yeah. the note to the applicant and to Amy saying, this goes with that, the amounts match, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, and then I'll know if you have, if there's any revision, so I should know if I need to sign an updated, if the bill will come be coming in a little different. Is there other mail just sitting there? I periodically, you know, every, every week or every other week, just okay. drop into town offices and look for things in the planning boards and mailbox. We should all we should all make an effort when we're there to look. Yeah. So what I propose to do uh, on this action is follow up separately by email with Sarah, Mary, and the appropriate staff at town offices, so we can clarify amongst ourselves the kind of you know workflow of handling these invoices, so that someone like Amy Lavalley knows about the expectation to scan and email the invoices to say Sarah, et cetera, and so forth. So I'll take that all up offline by email and then we'll have a solved problem. Very good. Thank Wonderful. you, Sarah. <laughs> no problem. It's okay. extending Very what good. I do in real life. <laughs> all right. Well, if there's no other business, then somebody could make a motion to adjourn. So moved. Anyone seconded. seconding that? Tom, Tom is seconded. All right. Um, roll call vote. Sarah? Yep. Tom? Aye. Judy? Aye. Don? Aye. I'm going to abstain just, just because. All right. We are adjourned. Have a great night, and we will see you all again on that. On last November 6th. November. On November 6th. Good night, everybody.